license. There we go. Okay. <coughs> so, today's lecture, uh, or today's little workshop here, is going to pick up where my last two workshops left off. So my first workshop was a um, introduction to R general, mostly base R stuff, sort of how do you get yourself up and running with uh, the R language using R Studio. Um, yeah, so some you know minor data manipulation, base R type stuff, some statistics, some things like that. My second workshop was intermediate R, where I introduced sort of the tidyverse packages um, in R, which are things like dplyr, and uh, I think I did a little bit of a tidier, um, and a couple other things, which are sort of the modern standards for manipulating and working with data in R, which are usually much easier to use or faster to get up to speed with than base R. Um, so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to kind of pick up after where I did data manipulation with um, visualization in R with ggplot2, which is a part of the tidyverse of packages. So with dplyr and um, tidyr and all those things, ggplot2 is uh, one of those packages. I don't, uh, I'm assuming basic some knowledge of how the uh, data manipulation would happen in the background. Um, I'll talk about that in, in a bit, but I'm going to focus pretty much entirely on plotting today. So a uh, quick setup. <laughs> um, the example data I like to use for ggplot is a commonly used uh, um, data set for visualization and for working with tidy data. It's called Gapminder. It's part of Hans Rosling's Gapminder project. They've been cleaned up and assembled in a nice format by Jenny Bryan up at the University of uh, British Columbia. If you want to install these data, in R, in the console, you just type install.packages and in quotes gapminder, that'll go and grab the package and uh, put it on your computer. You can then load the data with library gapminder. So, <coughs> the Gapminder data, if you say run structure or glimpse on the Gapminder data like this, they'll show you sort of what are the variables in it and what are some example values of these. So the Gapminder data you'll see here, it says class table df, it's, a, it's just a data frame. Um, 1704 observations of six variables. There's countries, continents, years, life expectancy, population, and GDP per capita. This is a sort of um, what do you call it, sort of development indicators for different nations in the world, ranging, as you can see, in year from 1952 onward to, I believe, 2007 in the current data set. So these are what you might call panel data. You have multiple observations per country of different years per country. Countries are nested inside of continents. All right? I'm sorry. Just got started, so you're just fine. More people is better. <coughs> so, okay. So what's interesting about this uh, data frame? So there are two variables which are factors. There's country and continent. Factors are sort of um, a categorical data with a number of levels to them. Um, they have an underlying numeric representation, which isn't too important for now. But um, that underlying numeric representation is what determines the order in which things will be plotted on a ggplot, which I might talk about a little bit later. Um, I say we'll spend a lot of time on factors later, but in reality I did not include the factor stuff I was going to get onto because of a lack of time. So we will not talk a lot about factors today. But my uh, previous workshop, you loaded up, I talk about factors in it. <clears throat> There's a lot of observations here. There's 1,704 rows. With 1,700 rows like this, you're not going to want to display all the data at once in your console or something like that, so we have to figure out ways to filter and work with the data without just manually selecting things in it. Right? And of course, like I said, there's a nested or hierarchical structure. There are years in countries, so the observations are country years. And there's another ID which doesn't uniquely identify things, which is just the continent. So these are a type of panel data, something that you would really commonly encounter you know, if you do national level work. Or let's say you work with something like individuals nested in neighborhoods or something like that. Almost all the work that I do involves some sort of multiply nested uh, data. <coughs> so. One thing we're going to want to be able to do to do plotting is we're going to want to be able to slice this data frame up, these Gapminder data, into subsets. So for instance, we might want, might want to just plot the rows from Afghanistan or just rows in the data from the year 1997. The easiest way to do this is with the package dplyr I introduced in my last workshop. Um, if you want to see more about dplyr, if you're unfamiliar with it, in my previous workshop, you can click on that link there. I have a full video, much like this workshop, on covering it. I'm only going to use a little bit of dplyr stuff, basically just subsetting uh, rows. <coughs> Anyway, dplyr is part of this tidyverse family of packages. If you do install.packages tidyverse in your console, it's going to take a while because it's going to install a lot of stuff. However, most of those packages are very good, very useful, and they're well integrated with each other. They have sort of a uniform syntax that makes it really easy to use them. And importantly, they're made to link up with ggplot, which is what we're going to be talking about pretty much all of today. <coughs> yeah. 
Yeah, I'll talk more about dplyr. Uh, oh, I guess actually I left that one in too. I don't have a ton on dplyr today. I like to start with a workshop that looks like it's about three and a half hours long and then slowly trim down until I reasonably, even at the speed that I talk, can get through it in one day. So yeah, not a ton on dplyr, but I'll show you a little example. So here's an example of subsetting dplyr to get an idea of the syntax if you're not real familiar. So let's say that what I wanted to do is I want to get down to the data in the Gapminder data frame that is covering the country of China. I only want China. I load up the dplyr library first, and then I say Gapminder pipe. The pipe there can be read um, as and then or then. So you could say take the Gapminder data and then filter such that country equals equals China. So I'm just saying I want the rows in the data set where the variable country has the value China, and I'm going to assign it up at the top, which you can't see because of the bezel on the screen, but I'm going to assign it right back to an, to an object I create called China. I'm going to get head on China. Head just gets the first six observations of it. We can see immediately that our filter worked. All the observations here are from China, and then we can see the other values. We've got continent as Asia because China is always in Asia in the data. It's not moving around the world. The years go from 1952 to 1977. It goes actually all the way to 2007, but head only gets the first six observations. Then we see life expectancy, population, GDP per capita. <coughs> so if you have any questions about this syntax here, let me know now, like what's going on here with the filtering. I'll use it a couple more times throughout here. This is just subsetting and selection in dplyr. It's roughly the equivalent of using the bracket subset operator. So if I said gapminder bracket gapminder dollar sign country equals equals China, we would get the exact same result. You have to have a comma after that, too, to keep all columns. But yeah, I like this syntax more, and this is what I've been teaching for four years now, and I find students learn the sort of tidyverse stuff much better. I don't actually introduce base R subsetting until fourth week, which was my lecture yesterday, and then they're like, oh, I kind of get these other things, but it was so much better to learn this stuff first because it's kind of a plain language way. You can just kind of read it left to right, top to bottom. <coughs> so... This is, uh, oh, I left my meme in, perfect. Uh, so this is my unit on ggplot2 that I use in my, uh, my CSS 508 class. Um, yeah, so that's Hadley Wickham there, who is actually, um, so Hadley Wickham is the primary author of ggplot2, dplyr, and most of those other R packages that we use. And it was actually funny that um, I had a, a meeting, he came to UW Seattle campus uh, two weeks ago, and I had a meeting with him on Friday and talked about nothing but teaching R stuff, which is pretty amazing, because he's, I mean, this guy in the R world is like, sort of like a Stephen Hawking or something. He's the absolute pinnacle of, of it. And to have him come and just sit down with students, and you know, I'm just a lowly grad student, and talk for 30 minutes about teaching this material is really amazing. Um, and I uh, almost showed him this meme, but I decided not to. So, <clears throat> anyway, <clears throat> so base R plots in R tend to have a syntax like this. So if you just say plot in R, it will run one of many different plot functions that sort of sit in R. By default, if you give it a formula like this with two variables where you say y equals something and x equals something, it runs a scatter plot. So this syntax here says, I want to plot life expectancy by year. It's a formula, so the left side, the left hand side of the formula is the y-axis, the right hand side is the x-axis. This says I want life expectancy on the y-axis, year on the x-axis. I'm going to give the x label of year, so it says year, capital Y there on the x-axis. Y label is life expectancy on the left side. The main is the title to it, life expectancy in China. The color of the dots is going to be red. CEX dot label will increase the size of the text on the, the bottom and the left side there by 50%. It's multiplicative. CEX main increases the text by 50% at the top. PCH 16 is the point size. The thing I would like to note about that is many of those arguments are complete gibberish when you look at them if you have not memorized what they all are. It's like, what is CEX? It's text scaling factor, but you wouldn't know that unless you looked in the help. PCH, what is PCH? If you've been in R a long time, you automatically know it's the points, um, size, or shape, depending on what you're doing. Kind of hard to know. And one thing you'll notice here is that the entire plot is done in a single function call. It's just plot. Okay. This is the last time I'm going to show any base R plot, but think about the structure of this. This is how base R plots work. Every single plotting function, base R plotting function, has a com often a completely different syntax here for how to do it, and it's all done in a single function call. ggplot does not work anything like this. <coughs> so, an alternative way of plotting <coughs> that many people prefer, most people prefer, I still use base R for some things, and some people are dedicated base R diehards, um, but the majority of people in the R world, especially in sort of like data science, like that, have moved on to ggplot. 
It's part of the tidyverse, like I said before. If you've done install.packages tidyverse, you could load library tidyverse and get all of them loaded, or you could just say library ggplot2 here, it'll load just that. <coughs> the core idea underlying ggplot2 is something called the layered grammar of graphics. Um, you can click there and go to a uh, journal article. I think that's actually, I don't know if that's the Wickham or the Wilkinson article on it, but it's sort of a philosophy of how we can break up plots into discrete elements or layers and combine them together the way we might sort of combine together language, things like verbs and adjectives and what to put together a sentence of something we want to present. <coughs> I'm not going to go into that philosophy. Instead, I'm just going to demonstrate how we do it. <coughs> so here's the exact same plot that I showed for the China one as ggplot. The syntax is very different. The first thing you might notice here is there's actually one, two, three, four, five, six, seven function calls being displayed here. The first is this ggplot1 that says data equals China, inside of which there is an AES, which stands for aesthetic. And that's where you're putting the variables, x equals year, y equals life expectancy. Then there's geom point, which actually draws the dots. Then there's a different function for the X label, the Y label, the title, and then the theme that applies a theme to the overall graphic. There's a bunch of different components here, but note they are all different functions. And what's happening is you initialize the plot with the ggplot up there, and then each line ends in a plus. You're just adding components to the original layer. You can keep adding things on. You build on top of a foundation. And if you want to get rid of something, you just remove it. But the individual function calls, you don't keep adding arguments inside of them very often. You normally just add layers to them. Every individual thing that gets plotted on the plot has its own function that gets added with a plus sign. We're going to go through a lot of examples of this to show you how the syntax works. <coughs> but first, <clears throat> I want to talk about the structure of this to make this make sense before I work uh, through it. So ggplot2 graphics objects consist of two primary components. The first are the layers. These are the visible components of the graph. We add them with a plus sign like I showed in that last example. This will include things like the lines drawn on the plot, shapes like polygons, or say boundaries of some geographical thing. ggplot2 is perfectly happy to work with geographical data pulled from my GIS systems. If you're interested in that sort of thing, my week nine lecture for my class is entirely on using geospatial data in ggplot. Um, and things like text. Anything that adds an element to it is a layer including labels, all that kind of stuff. <coughs> There's also aesthetics. Aesthetics control how layers appear. So the layers produce the thing, the aesthetics change how they look. So aesthetics are set with arguments. Things like color equals red would make all the elements of that particular layer red. This includes the locations of things, the colors and the signs. So we might use something like geom point to draw points on our plot, but then we set the aesthetic x and y, which determine where those points are on the plot, or their size, their transparency, something like that. <coughs> when you use uh, an aesthetic to link your data to a location, a size, a transparency, something like that, that is referred to as mapping your aesthetic. Your aesthetic is mapped to the data. If you instead want to say every individual, say, point in your geom point is the same color, like they're all color red, that's referred to as setting the aesthetic. You set it, it doesn't vary by the data. If it's mapped, it varies by values in the data. Very often, in fact, most of the time, we actually want our values to be mapped onto our data. We want our x location on it to be linked back to some x variable in our data, our y location, some y variable in our data. Maybe we want our color to be linked back to a categorical variable. Maybe our transparency is going to be linked back to uncertainty or some third variable or something like that. <coughs> so we're mostly going to focus on mapping, though I will show some setting. <coughs> okay. So there are a lot of different layers you can have in ggplot2. ggplot2, by default, has a lot of built-in layers. And there's all sorts of add-on packages that add new layers to it that you can just stuff on top of a normal ggplot. The first layer that you normally use when you create a ggplot is just this ggplot layer. What this does is it will normally initialize the object. That is, it sort of just creates an object, all the elements of it. And you'll usually give it some data. Those data are what are going to be used in all the subsequent layers in it. You don't have to give it a data argument there, but you do usually have to start with a ggplot object. <coughs> Another uh, common one is like geom point I showed before. It's just a layer of scatter plot points. You usually give it an x axis and a y axis, and it plots a point somewhere. Geom line will create a layer of lines. And so lines will work kind of like geom point. You give it x and y coordinates, but you give it multiple x, y's, and it will connect them by a line. And depending on what um, 
uh, mapping aesthetic you give it for a group, it will, de it will determine how to connect the different dots into single lines or one line or something like that. And we'll, we'll see this a lot. Um, then there's things like GG title, X lab, Y lab, which are the layers of the actual labels for the graphic. Facet wrap is one that would be unfamiliar to anyone working in base R graphics. What facet wrap is, it is a layer that breaks your plot into multiple individual plots stratified by some factor variable. That sounds complex, but as you'll see in a minute, it's incredibly easy to use and very powerful and has no analog in base R graphics unless you get really deep into the lattice package for old school people like me. Facet grid is the same idea, but what it'll do is it will arrange these additional plots it creates by factor variables on the x-axis and y-axis. So maybe you have one categorical variable you want to have as the rows and one categorical variable as the columns and stratify it that way. You could just give it two variables and it will do that. I'll have a good example of this later. It's actually from a paper I had published recently. Then something like themes. Themes will change how the entire plot looks. And you can get themes for things like the Economist, like magazine, has a theme. You can get like those web comics like XKCD as a theme that will make it look like the web comics and things like that. Tons of people have released themes. It just changes how the entire plot looks with a single call. Okay. <clears throat> Again, layers in the plot are separated by a plus sign. As long as a line ends in a plus sign, it will keep working its way down until it no longer has like a plus sign at the end, and then it will draw the plot. So you can have an arbitrarily large number of them. I'll show a couple complex plots later in this presentation that have an enormous number of layers on them. But because they just kind of are read additively, even though there's like 20 functions being run, you can just read it and figure out what it's going to look like as you go. And another nice thing is you can just take off one component, add a component, and just watch the plot slightly change. You can keep adding. With the base R graphics, you often can't just add or remove one thing or the entire thing breaks. <coughs> okay. <coughs> so. Aesthetics, so we all went through layers, but the aesthetics are how to control how those layers look. So common aesthetics you'll see in many different layers in ggplot are x and y, which are just the x and y coordinates for values. If you're plotting something in two dimensions, you usually have both an x and a y. Sometimes you'll only have an x if you're doing something like histogram. So we'll automatically, you give it an x, and that is just going to pool everything, put it across, and y is just going to be a count. So you only give it an x. I'll show an example of that in a little bit. Color will color the elements based on some data value or some set value. Group, group does not change the appearance directly of anything, but group will determine how um, individual like sets of observations are linked in some way. So let's say you have a whole a big scatter plot, but you know maybe you have um, time on the x-axis, some value on the y-axis, but you want to draw lines through each individual say country's observations. You group by country, and it knows then to draw the lines through those observations correctly. Just a way to inform ggplot how the data are grouped. <clears throat> Size would change the size of points or lines based on some value in your data, or you could manually set them. Maybe you want them bigger than default or smaller than default. And alpha sets the transparency based on some data value. <coughs> I'll show examples of all of these multiple times throughout this talk. Okay, so I mentioned before setting versus mapping. So layers will take arguments to control their appearance, like I've said before. <clears throat> Arguments like color, size, line type, shape, fill, and alpha can be used directly on the layers, and you can set them specifically for that. So if I did something like geom point color equals red, every dot drawn by that geom point is going to be red. These don't depend on the data, right? You just set them specifically for that layer. <coughs> Arguments that you put inside AES are mapped aesthetic. So the difference between something in AES and not in AES is the things inside AES are going to go and look for a variable and change those values by values of that variable. These are mapping aesthetics. They depend on the data. They'll look like something like this. GM point AES color equals continent. Now, in the scatter plot, every dot will have a different color for each continent. In these data, I think there's five continents represented. There'd be five different colors. Maybe it's six continents. <coughs> anyway, <clears throat> AES and ggplot in the initial ggplot call. So the very first call with the ggplot you make is ggplot. If you put an AES in there with particular aesthetics, every aesthetic you put in that first one will propagate to later layers. So let's say you have lines and dots and text in your plot, but you all want them to have the same colors and the same locations. You just put the locations and the colors in the first ggplot call, and all those additional layers don't need any arguments. They will just get it from the initial call. <clears throat> this might sound a little strange, but I'll show you in a minute how it works. It's very intuitive. <clears throat> okay. Anyway, 
This is all sort of pedantic and very precise when I say mapping and setting and stuff like that. The important thing about this is it makes it much easier to Google for your answers. So a very large amount of programming is just Googling to find other people's solutions to similar problems. Because unless you're basically like in advanced computer science, someone else has had your problem before, the trick is usually figuring out what is the name of that problem. It's out there somewhere, but the language is important. If you know the difference between setting and mapping, aesthetics and layers, it's very much easier to find these things. Stack Overflow is your friend. I literally have like links on my class webpage to places like Stack Overflow and things that you can go for, where programmers go for help. Inevitably, there is a solution to your problem. <coughs> okay, now let's see this all in action. So, if we make, I'm gonna reconstruct that China plot that I showed earlier. So, we start with a base layer. If I say ggplot data equals China, AES x equals year, y equals life expectancy, I get a plot that looks like this. You'll note this plot is blank. It has a year down with the values on the x-axis, life expectancy on the y-axis, but there is nothing on this plot. We've initialized it with the data, but we haven't told it to draw any layers. We haven't told it to do anything with the data other than make an x and a y-axis. <coughs> I could add to that geom point. With the geom point, now it just draws the dots. Notice I give it no arguments in geom point. It gets the x and the y location from that aesthetic in the original ggplot call. It just inherits it from above. Okay? Then I say, I would like them to be red and size 3. So, geom point, I just changed some setting aesthetics. I say color red and size equals 3. The dots are now red and 3 times as large. Okay? Next. I'm going to add on X label year. I didn't like that it was a lowercase Y in year. I'm going to make it uppercase because that's just how I am. So it's hard to see because of the bezel, but year goes from lowercase to uppercase. I change life expectancy to life expectancy like that. <coughs> I add a title at the top. It stays the same. It just attaches a title to the top. Then I say theme black and white. I don't like the base theme with all that gray. If you printed something like that, you'd waste a whole bunch of ink for no reason. Let's go with theme black and white, which is a little bit cleaner. And it looks like that. But my problem with this here is that my text is real small and hard to read. I'm going to say there, base size equals 18 inside the theme, because the size of all the text in the plot, in the labels and everything, is a attribute of the theme. I say base size 18, it just blows all the text up. It would not change text that was mapped to data in the middle of the plot. It will just change the axes, the tick marks, and the title. <clears throat> okay. Questions about that? It's not too bad. And this is actually the way that I would make one of these plots myself. I would start probably here with the G on point, and then just keep tapping things on until I'm like, eh, that looks pretty good, and stop. Right? Just kind of chew your way through them. So, now I have a nice plot. I like the way it looks for the China data. But what if I wanted to plot all of the countries in the data set, not just China? So here, if I do, the only thing I changed here is I said instead of data equals China, I said data equals Gapminder. All the data. We're going to get this mess. Everything else about the plot is exactly the same, but now because we don't just have China, we're going to get all the data points plotted like this. Right? We can't tell our countries apart might be easier to do something like following lines across uh, time here with the uh, year on the x-axis. So I change g on point there to g on line. Well, now we get something equally useless. What's going on here is it's just taken every dot basically in that scatter plot and connected all of them together with one line. It's not very useful, right? You look at this and you're like, okay, well, now there's a line, but it's still equally uninformative. What I'm going to do <coughs> here is I add an argument to the original AES, that is group equals country, and now what we have is we have one line connected for each country in the data set. The problem here, of course, is that my lines are still all the same color and they're super thick, so you can't see individual countries across the data. So I'm just going to remove size equals three in my geom line, and now all my lines are a standard thickness. So this is actually something beginning to convey some information. We can actually see each individual country over time. We see that by and large life expectancies go continuously up with some uh, exceptions in the case of certain large scale loss of life events in certain countries, which I'll talk about a little bit later. <coughs> okay, 
But we could do a lot better than this, right? They're all red here. We could use color in some better way than just making every single line red. We can color by continent. So I change color equals red in geom line. I drop that and move color equals continent into the AES in the original layer. Now, every continent has its own color there. We've got five continents, and you can actually track each continent's countries over time. Right? This plot is still pretty jumbled and a little bit hard to read. So rather than having color equals country like this, maybe what we want is to give each continent its own plot. Now, if you're working in BASA or some other platform, you're like, oh, God, it'd be a nightmare to go and just create. Now I have to create five more plots. I just say facet wrap tilde continent at the bottom. And now I have one plot for each continent. It maintains the colors, the x-axis, y-axis, and everything across all of them. It scales them appropriately. And now we have five plots, so we can look at each continent individually. <coughs> now the problem, though, is all my text is too big. I can't read my x labels, blah, blah. I would like to deal with that. So I say here, I just remove base size equals 18, let it scale itself to its default, and now I have a nice readable plot. You would need like a full width page to be readable in a nice way. I might want to do something else, like clean up my legend. I could take my legend and move it into that one gap right there, which I'm going to show in a different plot later. But this is a much better looking plot. And the neat thing about this is this is a plot that you could conceivably like actually have in a memo or show to somebody or something like that. It has very little code associated with it. It's laid out pretty logically, and you can make small changes to it just by adding or removing a single line of code. Right? <clears throat> Questions about this plot? Anything I've done here? Yeah, it's not too bad. <laughs> okay. If you want to store a plot, so if you're running and making a bunch of plots, say in an R script or something like that, if you want to store them to an object to use them later, or say to save them to disk as the R object, you can just assign the output of the entire ggplot chain of commands to an object. So this is that previous uh, slide's plot. I save it to an object life expectancy by year. It just writes the whole thing to that object. <coughs> the neat thing about this is if I write this ggplot to an object like that, I can still add layers and do modifications to this object here. So if I just type life expectancy by year, it reproduces the plot I created in the last slide. But I could say life expectancy plot, uh, by year, theme position, bottom. So I'm taking that object I wrote everything to, and I just add another layer to it. It's perfectly happy to work with life expectancy by year as if it were the entire chain of ggplot stuff from before. This is a nice thing you can do if you want to, say, create sort of a personal theme or style of plots. You can save them to an object and then just add things to it and not redo all that work. This is pretty nice. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> I'm going to go into some common problems, special cases, and some examples of how to modify like nitty-gritty little things in the plots now. So a common thing that you might find is you might want to do some scatter plot where one or more of your variables take discrete values instead of taking continuous values. This is quite common. An example of this might be I have continent plotted on the x-axis and I have year on the y-axis. I just wanted to see how many observations there are of each continent each year. Not the most useful plot in the world, but it's a nice example. <clears throat> the issue here is that because year only takes a value like 1952 and the countries take like just Africa, every single dot is on top of every other dot for that particular observation. So this plot is really uninformative. We just know from looking at it that it's probably a balanced panel data set, meaning there aren't missing observations, but it's not too useful. <coughs> what I could do is in geom point, I could add an argument. Position equals this function position jitter with 0.5 height 2. What this is going to do is for each dot on this scatter plot, it's going to randomly move it left or right up to 0.5 units our units on the bottom, because they're a categorical variable, are just spaced one unit as you go. So 0.5 says move it up to halfway to the other, uh, the next con or continent over. And then height 2 says move it up and down up to two units up and down. This data set is in five year intervals, so moving up down two, make sure they don't overlap in between. Now this actually conveys some modicum of information. We can see that there are not many countries in one of our continents. There are, in fact, only two, right? There's Australia and there's New Zealand. And that's the only thing represented in that continent. So you have two observations, two observations, two, so on. And then we can see Africa has way more countries, so on and so forth. Right? 
position jitter like that, sometimes it's useful. You often have these things, or you have things that are clustered real tight together, you just kind of want to expand them a little bit. If you do a plot like that, make sure to let people know you're jittering it, of course, but it's pretty useful. It's good for exploratory graphics, too, if you just want to get this like idea, a bird's eye view of something. You might not jitter them later, but it's good for exploration. <coughs> I think by default, if you don't say a width or a height, it just does it one unit in either direction by default, or it might automatically select appropriate units. A neat thing in ggplot is if you don't give things arguments, they actually don't just default to a single one. They usually change what their defaults are based on the data that you give it into something logical. A lot of work has gone into um, good, good defaults in ggplot. Very thoughtful. It's a lot of people working on this package for many years now. Okay. <clears throat> Another common thing you want to do is draw a histogram. So the geometry for histograms in ggplot2 is geom underscore histogram. What this will do is it will automatically bin the data you give to it, so you don't have to modify your data to bin it or to uh, aggregate your data in some way. You just say something like this. I say gapminder data and then ggplot these data. Notice how I just did pipe string to the ggplot. ggplot's first argument is the data, so you could do a whole bunch of data manipulation, pipe it straight into the ggplot, and it will just be able to plot with it without you putting making an object and putting it in. Anyway. <clears throat> Aesthetic, x equals life expectancy, and then I say the fill, that is the color that the actual body of a thing is going to be, is its continent, and then I just say plus geom histogram with 30 bits. What this is going to do is it's going to take that life expectancy variable, automatically bin it into 30 equal width bins, and then plot the counts of those on the y-axis. So it's actually done the underlying data manipulation for us, just a quick way to do histograms. A neat thing here I've shown that you could do here that's hard to do in BASAR histograms is I've actually pooled all the data. So I have all the Gapminder data, but I've color-coded the individual observations. So you can see the overall distribution of life expectancy looks like this, but you can see each individual continent's contribution to that overall distribution. So there's sort of a plateau starting at about 40 there, but it's dominated by the African countries. The spike up on the right is from the other continents. Yeah. Yeah, the bins equals 30 is saying that there are 30 like unique uh, 30 individual unique bars are going to be created. I can make 20 and I have 20 there and stuff. It's not the width of the bins, but the number of bins. It automatically figures out the widths for you. I believe you could also specify a width and it will automatically create a number of bins based on it. <clears throat> yeah. <coughs> And by default, if you don't specify a bins, it will calculate what it believes to be the optimum number of bins and plot it, but it will send a warning and being like, I've gone with this many bins. If you want a prettier, set your own type thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so you said this overall distribution of life expectancy is like the Mm -hmm. Oh, so this is actually, um, these are not overlaid, but they're stacked. Oh, it's Yeah, this is stacked run overlaid. With a histogram, I don't know if you could make them overlaid specifically. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, this is just, uh, the Africa observations are starting right here on top of it. Yeah, and so they just kind of stack up. So it's still showing the overall distribution. It's yeah. just a histogram, but it's not, you could do a stacked or a, like a nested bar plot with a different geometry too. Is right. that your question? Or? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can see that in the Africa, they have like so like high life expectancy, like 70. So if I read it, it's like this. Well, it's the, so it's the count here, right? And since it's the count, it's just saying essentially there's like 50 African countries, are, or not 50 African countries, but there's uh, 50 um, country years of uh, a country year observations that have a life expectancy in that range. Right. So because it's, it's panel data, you know, this is like, right here is, uh, this is, there's 50 country years of African countries that have life expectancies of about 40. This isn't the most useful plot in the world. It's kind of a weird one. It was more just a showcase for the fact that you can do a histogram, but you can still apply all the normal things to it. You might come up with a reason to do something like this, but histograms are somewhat misleading in panel data because every country has a large number of observations, so it's a little bit weird. Um, but 
it's an example of something to do. And it had occurred to me when I looked back at my ggplot lecture that I did in the second week of this term that I never talked about histograms. And people do a lot of histograms. I was like, wow, that's a gross oversight. So I made this last night and put it in these slides. So that's why it's not perfect or informative. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So <coughs> things you might want to do. You might want to change the axes on your plot. You can do things like change the range of your x and y axes using x lim and y lim. x lim give it two values and it will make the first one the minimum, the second one the maximum. So you can kind of zoom your plot in and out. You could change to a logarithmic or say square root scale on either axis. If you say scale x log 10, it will change the x axis to a logarithmic scale and still plot everything correctly on it. And you could have it still have the correct breaks, which I'll show in a minute, even though the scale is plotted logarithmically. You might have a square root scale or something. So if you need to scale something like a lot of measurements are highly skewed, like GDP per capita or GDP even, you usually want to rescale that variable in some fashion because it has some massive you know, values way off on one side of the distribution and everybody else is clustered in the small. Okay. You might also just want to change where the major and minor breaks are. Major and minor breaks. Major breaks are sort of the big breaks that get a um, a label on the x or y axis, and minor breaks are where small lines would go on it. They don't usually have a labeled value. <coughs> Just give it a vector of breaks and it will put um, tick marks there. Okay. You'll notice I'm doing this in something called scale x continuous, scale x log 10, scale y square root. I'm going to talk about scales here in a minute. Okay. But first I'm going to show simple axis changes. So this is the, a plot with the China data. X is year, Y is GDP per capita. It's a geom line. I don't have to group it here because I only have one country of data. Then I say scale Y log 10. This is going to put the Y axis in a log 10 scale, which makes a lot of sense because GDP growth just massively exploded in China um, halfway through our data set basically. So I want to compress the top axis to make it more readable. I say I want breaks at 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, and 5,000 dollars. And I want to label it in a dollar scale. So there's a package in R called scales that has built-in ways of processing your data to display pretty scales on a plot. I just say labels equals scales colon colon dollar. That says look inside the scales package for a function called dollar. And then it knows how to take those data and label them appropriately. What that does is it takes the raw number like a thousand, adds in a comma, decimal points, and a dollar sign in front of it. So just by doing that, it's been converted to $5,000, $4,000, $3,000, $2,000, 1000 Looking into the scales package can save you a lot of time on like manually manipulating your data to have pretty labels. Just handles it for you. It's really cool. Another Hadley Wickham package. Dudes everywhere. Then what I did is I changed my X limits to be all the way back to 1940. My data started like 1952, but I was like, let's extend it a little bit and up to 2010. And then I gave it a title. <coughs> so this is a plot that's a little bit more useful than if it wasn't logarithmically scaled. If it wasn't logarith logarithmically scaled, it would just skyrocket. Yeah, um, there's a lot of you know there's a lot of variables that are um, sort of has, appear to have a logarithmic progression, or um, you might say that they're like relative to some variable, sort of log normally distributed or something like that. It's actually really common. Um, GDP is one of those ones that's sort of a classic one because uh, um, GDP, both wealth and income, build on wealth and income, so you have an acceleration uh, with it. But there's a lot of other things that are logarithmically distributed, um, some, and some things are linearly log log, so they They'll look weird if you, um, like if you put a log on the x-axis, log on the y-axis, they'll be nice and linear like that, but look a little bit weird in other ways, like they're accelerating on both axes. There's common variables like that. You'll see, if that happens, you'll see your data clustered highly, like um, on one end of the distribution and then have it kind of trailing off. If you log everything, it'll be nice and normal. Um, yeah, it just depends. I usually... Um, Sometimes you'll have a good theoretical reason or a good reason justified in the literature for setting up in some particular way, but um, other times I'll just you look at your data and be like, this is ugly unless I log it, and then you log it. Yeah. Do they have a natural log? Natural log? Yeah. Ah. So log 10 here, um, I think, I'm trying to think if there is a, a natural log one. Um, you can, of course, log the uh, natural log the variables manually. So just the log function is, a, is the natural log. But I don't know if there's a, a scale y log 10. There might be a scale y log base that will let you uh, set the base. 
um, but I'm not sure. Uh, I've only ever used uh, scale y log 10 or manually logged my variables. I work with a lot of log variables. If you want to fit your model or something with a log variable, you just log it in the formula or log it in the data. That's what I normally would do, but I'm not sure. You can look around in ggplot and see if, uh, oops, there's uh, that one. That's the only one I ever use for logging. Log 10 has a nice sort of um, shape in its acceleration that's good for plotting data, so log 10 is pretty nice. Yeah, good question though. Anything else? Not too bad. Okay. Maybe your fonts are too small, or maybe, you know, like me, you're basically just going blind. You want to make your text really big. The only thing I did here is I said base size equals 20, which is the same thing I showed before. Inside my theme gray call. Theme gray is this gray plot where you've got, you know, removal from the gray is what's drawing your app, your lines, uh, your what are graticule lines. Yeah, base 20. Shown that before, nothing fancy here. <coughs> so Text and tick adjustments. If you want to modify text size, the labels, the tick marks on it, the tick marks are just the, the little marks that come off around the axes and link to like a value. You can mess with all these things precisely in arguments to a layer called theme. So you'll see here I did theme underscore gray. That is not the same layer as just theme. I would recommend if you do something like theme black and white or something, do the theme call afterwards because something like theme underscore gray actually changes all of these values that are inside theme. So you want to do theme last to do minor tweaks. If you're somebody who's really particular about how things work, like me, or how things look, you'll have like a theme call at the end that has just these minor modifications of things. It's the way you can get that like nitty gritty stuff that you would normally manually set on everything in like a base R plot. In this, you know, you just kind of go with the defaults and then change the couple things you want fixed. Examples of things you might change in theme. So all of these ones are an argument like plot title equals that sits inside that theme function. And then usually the argument to say plot.title is going to be another function. So this is saying plot.title equals this thing element text. So in ggplots, every individual element in the plot, like the title, the you know, the, um, the axes, the tick marks, are a type of um, graphics object, an element, and you actually modify the properties of those using something like element text. This says, I want to take this text element and modify a couple arguments of it for this particular plot. It's a little arcane, I'd recommend messing with it. It's much harder to explain verbally than to play with it and just see how it works. This one here is saying, I want to take my plot title, the title of my plot, and make the size twice as large as it would normally be. I say size equals REL2, that is relative size 2, twice as large as normal. 1 would be standard size, and then H just 0 left aligns it. H just 1 would right align it, H just 0.5 would be center aligned. So you can justify things. You could also do negative values or values greater than 1 and stick them outside the plot. Usually you won't want to do that, but every once in a while you come up with some crazy idea and you want to move it a little bit. Like maybe you have, um, you want to align it a little bit outside because of where your plot's going to go. Or you have two plots next to each other, but you actually want to use like the plot on the left one and move it all the way over. Weird stuff like that. You do you and make it look good and it'll be, it's good to know those exist. Another thing you might want to do is you might want to rotate your x-axis labels. Maybe you have really wide values on your x-axis, long country names or something like that. One of the easiest things you can do, a lot of people don't like rotated labels, but sometimes it's all you can do. You can say axis.text.x, so that's going to be the x-axis text labels, equals element text angle 45. We'll take them and it will rotate them 45 degrees. Okay? <clears throat> Another thing might be axis.text. Notice here I have axis.text.x for the first one, but then just axis.text. .x will only change the x-axis. If I don't put .x, it will change both axes. So there's kind of a hierarchy to this, these arguments. I could make my, X, my axes, both of them, be the color blue. Notice here I spelled color with a U. ggplot will happily accept both British English and American English because it's an international package for every function in the entire package. I just like that. It's kind of nice. It's because Hadley, Hadley Wickham is from New Zealand. So, yeah. <clears throat> um, so what that'll do is make the X and Y axis labels blue. Axis.ticks.length would make those tick marks longer or shorter. Maybe you want really short ones, maybe you want really long ones. I don't know why, but like I said, you do you. Um, and like I said before, theme is not the same layer as theme underscore gray or theme underscore black and white. Um, those things you usually want to do before you do theme. Now, 
Go to the documentation if you want to see. There's a tremendous number of arguments in theme. You can modify like every element of a plot in there. It's pretty rare that I come across something in ggplot that I want to modify, but I can't modify with either a, a argument to a layer or argument to theme itself. Every once in a while, though, I do find something that drives me up the wall. It's pretty rare, though. <coughs> so, <clears throat> scales. I mentioned scales before with something like scale x log 10, scale y log 10. Well, there's a lot of scales, and they follow a similar syntax for what type of scale you want to apply to something. They control how your mapped aesthetics appear on the plot. You might do something like, uh, so the overall structure is, they start with scale, underscore, then the aesthetic you want to modify. So that could be color, size, alpha, x, y, those are all the different aesthetics. There's a scale for all of them. Then underscore option. The option is the type of way or the way in which you want to modify that scale. So you might do something like scale underscore line type manual. What this says is I want to modify the lines on the plot. So every individual line might be a different type of line or different groups of lines might look differently, say dashed, dotted, or something like that. And I want to do this manually. Rather than let the ggplot determine how the line types are going to look, I want to set each line type manually because I'm very particular. That's the type of thing I do with scale line type. You might do scale alpha continuous. What this will do is it will do a scale on your alpha aesthetic. Your alpha is your transparency and map it to a continuous variable. And what scale alpha continuous will let you do is control how that alpha like goes, what it's minimum like transparency, maximum transparency, the range of it, that sort of thing. Or map it to a different variable than the one you've used for something else. <coughs> scale color brewer is a neat one. This links up to color palettes in the color brewer 2 package to give you nicely like arranged colors. The co cool thing about Color Brewer, you go on here, is that they've used cognitive and visual science to determine optimal color patterns, things that are like, don't violate problems for uh, color blindness. Um, they put, uh, put them, like if you imagine a color wheel, they'll evenly distribute the colors around the color wheel. So if you have five variables, it'll form a pentagon on the, uh, the color wheel so they have maximum distance. And they'll also adjust the like luminosity, everything correctly to make them appear equal at luminosity, which won't always be the same for different colors because humans don't perceive all the colors as equal brightness, even if they are technically speaking the same brightness. Um, this is pretty neat, and so this saves you the time of manually selecting colors. You can be like, okay, I just want the spectral palette I see at colorbrewer2.org, and this will automatically apply it to your colors. Really cool. And Color Brewer has palettes for continuous variables and categorical variables. It has scales that start at, say, red, have a middle of white, and then go to blue, like they transfer colors all the time. A lot of different reasons you might want to have different ones. It's really cool. Anyway, there are a ton of these different scale uh, layers you can add. I highly recommend Google Stack Overflow or other some resources I'll show here in a bit for figuring these out because you can just do whatever you want. There's a lot of ways to do it. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so here's an example of tweaking things manually in a plot. So I've done that same plot I had before. In fact, I'm just adding to it the life expectancy by year plot. And then I say, okay, I'm going to do a manual color scale to it. I say scale color manual. The name argument to your scale is the name that goes on the legend. So you can see I've done, and I'll explain this in a minute, which continent are we looking at comes over here, which continent we're we looking at is the legend. You'll see what I've done is I say which backslash n continent backslash n are we backslash n looking at. Backslash n in text like that is a line break character. So it breaks it onto a new line everywhere I put a backslash n. This is a common old, uh, I don't remember what, when the, where the that line break escape character comes from, but it's old. It's like Unix old, you know, in the 70s. Anyway, it works. <clears throat> then I say, okay, I want to specify exact values for every continent in my data set. So I say here, the values are, because it's scale color manual and color's already been assigned to continent, I don't have to specify the variable anymore. I just specify the values that are in that variable. I say values equals, I want every observation associated with Africa to be sea green, the Americas to be turquoise, Asia to be royal blue, so on and so forth. And those colors just line up. Those colors are colors built into R, so R has these names like sea green that are attached to some color hex code. You could, if you're somebody who likes working with hex codes directly, like me, to make everything on my web page look the same, I would, you could do like equals, um, like, hashtag or, or pound sign and then all of the hex values, so like a six or an eight value of hex, 
And you can do your colors manually like that. It's really good if you want everything unified. For instance, these slides, the color, like purple and everything, everything is the exact same shade of purple because I've manually set the hex codes universally across all my slides, all my web pages, all that kind of stuff because I'm very particular. You can do you. Okay, so I set values like that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Here's an example of me doing a very fussy manual legend for a plot. And this can show you how your ggplots can spiral out of control totally, or at least look that way. But you can actually read logically through this and explain what's going on. There is, however, a lot going on here. I say here, take my ggplot data, or take my ggplot, data is going to be gap minder. My x-axis is going to be year, my y-axis is life expectancy. I'm going to group my observations by country. I have two different geom line calls. I have one line that's 50% transparent. Its AES is going to be color equals in quotes country, size in quotes equals country. I'm going to create my own special country scale here in a minute. I say geom line stat equals smooth, method equals low S. I'm going to draw a nice low S smooth curve through every like continent's observations to get an at continent average for life expectancy which is grouped by continent, color, continent, size, continent in quotes, because I'm going to create my own special continent scale. Alpha, 0 0.5, so the line doesn't overdraw my other ones. Facet wrap by continent, so I'm going to have a different row for each continent, but I'm going to fix it to two rows. So if I had a, was on a planet with many more continents, it would still be fixed to two rows. Then I say, scale color manual, the name is life expectancy four, values, country is black. That means every country line is going to be black. Continent equals blue. All the continent lines are going to be blue. So I've fixed them, but I'm still doing it in kind of an aesthetic up here because they're, it is still being determined on the fly by the data. We'll see what this looks like in a second. Scale size manual. I want the country lines to be 0.25 size. The continent lines to be three. I want them to be much larger. Then I say theme minimal base size 14, I give it a title, a subtitle, I move the legend into a specific position, and I rotate my text 45 degrees. There's a lot going on here. Let's go through it to see what happens at each stage of this. So I draw my sort of foundation. Year on the x-axis, life expectancy there, group doesn't do anything different to the plot. Then I say geom line. This is what the plot would look like with every continent drawn there just as lines on there. Kind of like the plot we did earlier, except it's not red and oversized. <laughs> then I add to that this smoothing line. You'll notice barely anything gets added, because by default it's black. There is, however, in the middle of there, a low S smoother line. A low S smoother is just a local, um, technically speaking, it's a local scatter, scatter plot smoother. So it's essentially taking the, the local conditional mean of a variable and drawing a line through it. It's a little bit more flexible. It's a non-parametric regression method. Doesn't matter, but it's a way to draw nice, easy means through data that might not be totally linear. We'll see how it looks in a second. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> grouped on continent. So this means that it's going a smooth line through all of the countries for each continent. Then I say facet wrap by continent and row equals two. Our plots are then broken down to facets. Then I say scale color manual. And you see what I'm doing here is I'm changing three lines. My geom line now has AES color equals country. My line for continent has color equals continent. And then I have skull color manual where I did country equals black, continent equals blue. So you can now see the low S smoother line going through the center of all the data is blue. The other one is still black. I just wanted to leave it black. And it's added a legend over here that says life expectancy four, continent is blue, and country is black. Okay. <clears throat> now, scale size manual. I've just increased the continents to be a size 3 line. I've reduced the country lines to be 0.25. So I can see country lines are narrower, continent line is big. And you'll see the legend automatically changes in a corresponding fashion. You don't have to manually set any of that. Then I go up here and I set the transparency. So I did alpha equals 0.5 in both those arguments up there. All it did is make it so I can now see through these lines. Okay? If you have a lot of data plotted on top of each other, sometimes just a little bit of transparency will make it look a lot better. Okay? <clears throat> then I say theme minimal, base size 14. The text increases in size, it gets rid of some of this extra gray. But you'll see my X labels here are totally overlapping each other. 
I say here, well, okay, first I guess I add a title. I want life expectancy 1952 to 2007 with a subtitle by continent and country. Then I rotate my x-axis labels 45 degrees. I justify, I say vertical justified one, horizontal justified one. This moves them all the way up and all the way to the right. What this does is make sure that this line for 1950 lines up with the end of that particular number, me being very particular. Got to have everything line up properly. And then I bring in the legend to buy me some extra space. So I say legend.position equals 0 0.85, 0 0.1. So the way those work is that <clears throat> for the first number, it's the x location. 1 would be all the way to the far right. 0 would be all the way to the left. For the second number, 1 would be at the very top. 0 would be at the bottom. So 0.85 moved my legend here. 0.1 moved it up to here. So my legend now takes the spot where there would otherwise be another plot, and it buys me a huge amount of space. <clears throat> so this is the way that I would actually generate one of these plots bit by bit. I have some dumb idea about how I want my plot to work, and I just say, OK, let's play with it and keep adding one line at a time and drawing new things until it starts to look the way I want. The order of the layers, by and large, doesn't matter. So I could have done these in whatever order I want. I could move things around and mess with it. But I eventually sort of center in on some particular type of plot that I want. But it's additive and it's iterative. And most programming that you'll actually do in your life is actually really iterative. You never have anything perfect to begin with. I tell my students that um, programming is about spiraling through failure until you find success at the center. And it's like, realistically, that's what you're doing. You get error message, error message, error message, error message. But if you can read them, they're informative. And eventually, you make your way in to something correct. Well, plots are exactly the same thing. I mean, look at the garbage that I, I start with here. I'm just like, oh god, no, 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 maybe. We're getting there. Eh, 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 yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. Ever, right. And that's how these things work. They're very. They can be particular, and the more complex they are, the harder it is. Right. Questions about this? <coughs> so this is a plot that I actually be informative to somebody. You could provide a plot like this and be like, okay, I've got a continent average. I can see individual countries. Some things jump right out when I look at a plot like this. I mean, as like a sociologist and a demographer, I look at this and I'm like. What is going on in these particular observations? Like you see a big dip in Africa right there, but only for one country, and a big dip in Asia right there, but only for one country. You guys know your history? You know what those two are? It's about the great push forward. Where the, the great, the... No. no, you think. No, it's something far, far, far worse. Oh. Okay, um, if you look at the time, <clears throat> it is right before, kind of a little before 1980s. It's the late 70s, um, Khmer Rouge. That's Cambodia. And then over there in Africa, that big dip is the Rwandan genocide. So the only thing that nukes life expectancy like that is genocides. Um, yeah, so as a demographer, as soon as I saw that pop up, I'm like, oh, I know what that is. And I know why well, I'm a criminologist and a demographer. And so like genocide is a criminology topic. And then life expectancy is that. I'm like, oh, this is both of my things. Um, yeah, but yeah, big drops like that. You would also see there is a bump um, in life expectancy in, in China where it has kind of an erratic one, but it's nothing like a genocide event. Genocide is ludicrous in its effect on life expectancy. You know, that's a life expectancy dropping down to 30 years right there. Yeah, I mean, that's like caveman level uh, life expectancy. Genocide is bad. Okay. More on customizing legends. <clears throat> you can do things like you know move your legends around, flip orientations. Like you can take an axis and just say coordinate flip, and it will flip it. Won't have to modify the data, but it will just change whether one or zero say is on the y on top of the y-axis, <clears throat> or remove them, stuff like that. Cookbook for R is a really nice website for like answering questions about how you modify weird little things in your plots. It's actually a terrific website. Um, there's also the uh, the R Graphics Cookbook is a is slightly different. It's a, a book, but it's become free recently. You can just go and look it. In fact, the neat thing about R is that basically every good R textbook is free these days. If you have to pay for it, it's actually probably not one of the better R textbooks. My favorite R textbooks are all linked off of the R uh, website. Um, R for Data Science, Advanced R, Kieran Healy's recent visualization book, which I'm about to plug here in a bit. Um, all these books are actually also free online. So like my students in all my classes, I, I haven't assigned a textbook, whether I teach statistics or teach my art class, I haven't assigned a textbook anyone has to buy in seven years or something like that. Nobody should ever have to buy anything. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> if you want to save a plot as an image file to disk, 
there's a function gg save. So let's say that I've created this beautiful plot that I want to save and I want to share with people. It's going to my Christmas cards or something. I'm going to say gg save. I'm going to name the file. Here I say I saved a file.pdf. I name the plot I want to save. So it's a ggplot object I've created. If you don't say anything with plot equals, so you just leave it off, it will just save the last plot created. I said height 3, width 5, units inches. So this is saying I want the plot to be 3 inches tall, 5 inches wide, units of that. If you don't modify those manually, it will come up with defaults. And if you do modify the units, like height 3, width 5, it will still modify the size of every element in there to plot at sort of an appropriate proportion for everything. It's pretty good about scaling things to be nice. <clears throat> yeah, and you'll notice here, I just said I saved a file.pdf. It reads whatever file extension you put there and saves the file as that. You put PDF, it saves a PDF. If I put PNG, it saves a ping file. If I put JPEG, it'll save a JPEG file. It has a certain number of ones it can do. I think even it'll even do some odd ones like TIFF files and stuff like that. Sometimes you have like a journal that's still living in 1985 and they're like, I only accept TIFF files or something like that. You can save them. I like SVG files. I save SVGs a lot. <clears throat> okay. There's also the bad and non-reproducible way to save your plots, which is to open up the little plot window and use a snipping tool and save it. I do that when I'm going to send something to like my advisor or something, right? Because it is a little bit faster than this. And also it lets me rescale it until it looks just right. But if I'm going to do anything else, I do it like that. It's one of those things I'm like, students, don't tell like Hadley Wickham that I told you to snip it, but it's really fast. And if you only got to do a plot once, just snip it. Save yourself some time. <coughs> I do scold myself there for it, though. Okay. <clears throat> so this is something I added uh, for this particular workshop that um, normally doesn't get done until week 11 of the class that I teach at um, uh, UW Seattle, which is plotting model results. Well, we've done a whole bunch of plotting your data, but very often we're actually working with models we've run and we want to see something from those models. I'm going to show a couple different methods. <clears throat> the first one I actually showed already a little bit, which is geom smooth. So geom smooth, if you, if you don't mess with its arguments in a way, draws this nice low S smoothing curve through it, which is a type of model. It's a smooth conditional mean. If you have a large number of observations in your data set, instead of drawing a low S curve, it will still draw, instead draw a GAM, a generalized additive model, which is a type of spline model. If you're not familiar, the words don't matter. It just draws a nice smooth line. Um, but normal like regression models we use um, are conditional mean models. Like a low S is a conditional mean. It's non-parametric, but it's a conditional mean. Well, Ordinary least squares regression, generalized linear models are still conditional mean models. They, they give you some value of x, conditional on, some average value of y, rather, conditional on a value of x. It's a conditional mean model, which means geom smooth can also be used to draw those by changing its arguments. Geom smooth will do all sorts of different bivariate models. And when I say bivariate, that also includes quadratic and cubic models. There's still two variables, even if you have multiple parameters. So, for instance, here, I've taken a ggplot of all the Gapminder data, AES x equals year, y equals life expectancy, color equals continent, and then I say g on point, I've positioned jittered it so we can see the individual observations so we know our smoother is actually going through our data in a realistic way. <clears throat> this is the default g on smooth. So this is a, in this case, a low S smoother because the individual groups have less than 1,000 observations. If an individual group had over 1,000 observations, it would fit a GAM model instead. The GAM model model S will look exactly the same, but that just lets you know what that warning message is saying in R, because it will tell you, I fit a GAM model because you have lots of observations. The reason it does that is low S models, um, low S uh, has an explosive memory consumption as uh, observations get large because it's like a local smoother. Not important. Anyway, so we have this nice smooth that goes through it. But being sort of a non-parametric uh, regression method like this, you know, it kind of has a, for instance, it's kind of got a, like a little bit of a kink here are like quick changes, which is fine, and that's maybe what the actual conditional mean looks like. But we might want to parameterize this some way. <clears throat> I could say <coughs> geom smooth method equals GLM, a generalized linear model, formula y tilde x. So this says fit a generalized linear model, which is going to be identical to a OLS model, where I say y depends on x. Now the lines are going to be perfectly straight because I fit a standard linear model going through those conditional means. Okay? <clears throat> it's like, oh, okay, well, now I fit a standard linear model in here. It might not be a great fit, though, for some of them because we see some of these are curved. A lot of them have a pretty good curve to it. You might be like, oh, well, why don't we fit a polynomial on that? So I say, same thing, method equals GLM, but the formula now is y tilde 
polynomial x2. This is a polynomial of second degree. So the model it's fitting is going to be y equals x plus x squared. There's two parameters on it. It's still a bivariate model, because the only thing on that side is our x variable year. But you can do quadratic models, cubic models, whatever you want. You can modify that formula, and it will fit an appropriate regression line across that. <coughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. So if you want some bivariate fit line like that, you can totally add it on. <clears throat> it might, you might ask, well, how do I do a multivariate line? Well, the thing is, if you think about it, it doesn't actually make sense to plot any kind of multivariate regression line on here, but it's because by controlling for another variable, it's going to shift the entire thing all over the place. It's never going to go through the scatter plot lines if the other variables in the model matter in any way. You'd have to condition both your y and your x, which would be a type of thing called a partial plot. I'm not going to cover partial plots, but now you know the term to Google if you want to do it. <clears> okay. <throat> Another thing you might want to look at, particularly if you have more complex models and something bivariate, um, is you might want to look at plots of the marginal effects, the plots of the parameters, or the plots of predicted values for things. Instead of like drawing a line through the scatter plot, you might just want to actually be like, OK, graph me my parameters in the model, or graph me predicted values based on counterfactual values of x. Like I want to set my variables to specific values and plot the outcomes. This is something that used to be kind of a pain to do in R. This package, ggfx, has made it just ridiculously trivial. I teach a class that requires like no statistical knowledge, and I also teach a class on this for undergrads. I teach them counterfactual marginal effects plots and predicted values in it in 15 minutes, and no one has a problem with it. This is, was very different four or five years ago. <clears throat> anyway, so this ggfx package contains two things. It contains a function called ggpredict, which will compute predicted values for an outcome variable at specific margins of specific variables. So you could set values and it will do marginal calculations. <clears throat> and then a function plot.ggfx, which is a plot method for it. So it will see whatever you've produced from ggpredict. If you just run plot on it, it will produce a ggplot with it, not a base R plot, where everything is graphed and organized nicely for you with you giving it no arguments. It's really neat. So if I loaded up library ggfx, I might do something like this. I'm going to create first some simulated data because I want some special properties in here. I want some categorical and numeric variables. I want them correlated in a nice way. If you want to know how to like simulate counterfact or simulate data for some purpose, steal this off of the slide, use it, and you can see what I've done. I'm not going to dwell on it though because this is not a unit on simulation, which my student, my undergrads get. But yeah. I teach statistics with uh, simulation and randomization, so you don't have to teach them any parametric stuff. Like, I don't have to talk about a normal distribution or anything, because I do everything with randomization and simulation. So like undergrads in a 300 level class can get all the way to advanced generalized linear models and stuff, because I do everything in randomization and simulation. It's all Monte Carlo. I love it. Anyway, <clears throat> yeah, saves you. Make the computer do all the hard work. Anyway, when you run ggpredict, what it will do is it will produce a data frame with automatically with a row for every unique value of some supplied predictor, whatever is your independent variable or variables you give it. <clears throat> so for instance, I've run a model here, a linear model, where I say a numeric y, so y is just a numeric variable, depends on some numeric variable and some factor variable in my simulated data. I then just give this linear model object, so LM1, as the first argument to GG predict, and I say terms equals num1. Okay? That's the entire thing I'm going to give it. The output I get here is this. This one now creates a data frame where I have values of x running from negative 6 to 6. It created even breaks in that particular variable that I want to go over, a predicted value, a standard error, and the low and the high confidence interval for it. Well, if you look at this, this is the format that ggplot expects your data to be in to plot it. Right? I have a single observation on each row like that. I have four variables in here. I can plot whatever I want. And it says down here that it is adjusted for fact one. So this is saying that these predicted values are based on it holding constant that factor variable at one particular level. The level is at level A. So it even tells you what the reference category is that's being held constant, which you could change if you wanted. <clears throat> I can just take lm one est and put it into a plot. I just say plot it. This is a plot of my predicted um, values for the variable. So as num1 variable goes from negative 6 to 6, my predicted, val predicted yn goes from about negative 2 to 3.75 or so with correct confidence intervals that are calculated using a a proper simulation-based confidence interval method. 
or a profile likelihood, depending on the, the linear model you gave it. So nice confidence intervals, a nice plot of predicted effects done with what really could be one line of code. Two if you, you know, use a, a terminal width uh, <clears throat> editor. Okay? So it just kind of works. It has a plot method on it. You just feed pipe things through. You could actually take your data, modify your data, pipe it straight into the model, pipe the model into ggpredict and pipe it into plot, and it will output everything without you ever creating an object or anything, which is how I usually do it. It's really nice. Okay. <clears throat> it has a lot of other things it can do. So let's say I have now here created a logit model. I've said generalized linear model. Uh, yb is a binary variable. Binary variable depends on a numeric variable, a factor, another numeric, and another factor variable. So I have four variables in the model. I say family equals binomial, link equals logit, so uh, standard logit model. I pipe it straight into ggpredict, and I say I want to make my predictions over two variables. The first variable is going to be the x-axis. The second variable is going to be a group term in ggplot. So I say numeric one and factor one. Now what I have as a plot is I have all the values of that numeric one variable on the x-axis, and then I have color-coded groups based on the factor one variable. So value A, value B, value C, color-coded with their confidence intervals here, and these are, by default, predicted probabilities of the outcome. So without me saying anything, it says, oh, it's a logit model, you want predicted probabilities. It's not like predicted log odds, predicted odds ratios, it's just already going straight to the probabilities, which are normal human consumable numbers. Right? <clears throat> this is a little bit hard to read, though. So I might say plot facet equals true, and it will automatically ggplot facet them out, and they get their own plots. So this leverages that little bit of code in ggplot to produce nice outputs. And because this is a ggplot object, I could add themes to it. I could do plus and add any ggplot layer to it. I could change the themes. I could change the labels, everything, just by adding plus something to the end of it. This is a much better way to do these sort of counterfactual value plots than base R methods. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Maybe you want specific values. So that was picking default values. It just looks in your data. It's like, let's give them a full range. You might want to look at specific values. Here I've given it the same model, but now I say, I want to look at that numeric one variable at three values, negative one, zero, and one. And I want to look at the factor variable only at factor level A and factor level B. Then it does it. That's the syntax for it. You just put them in square brackets like this and specify specific values. It will give them to you. Now numeric one only runs from negative one to one. And if you look, this, this line is actually here, kinked in here, because it's only done three values of it. I've said negative one, zero, one. So there's actually only three points it's drawing a line through. And then factor A and B is only an A and B, and it's dropped the C facet. Okay. I could, however, say I want it to use specific like um, automatically calculated values for my counterfactuals. I could say like, what I want is I want the mean plus minus one standard deviation, or I want to go from the minimum to the maximum with the median value in the middle. Instead here I say numeric one mean SD. What this here is running from the mean of numeric one minus one SD to plus one SD. So the mean for numeric one, you know, is right about here and then one minus one standard deviation to plus one standard deviation. And then for min max for numeric two, numeric two, this is the minimum of numeric two. That is the maximum of numeric two. So it's giving me just the minimum and the maximum and faceted on that. There's a lot of options inside this package if you want to look at for sort of automatically calculating this thing. So you don't have to do anything by hand. You just go, give me this, give me that. It'll plot them out and give you these nice ones. It will also do dot plots of your uh, um, like if you have categorical by categorical things, you can do dot plots. So in this case, I've said I have a linear model where y depends on two factors. I then say ggpredict factor one, factor two. It knows their factor variable, so it doesn't make sense to do a continuous plot of it. It automatically converts it into a dot plot with confidence intervals. So here I've plotted so that these are the different levels of factor one. There's A, B, and C. Each gets its own here. And then factor value for yes and no for factor two with confidence intervals so you can see, you know, statistically significant differences across these things. Technically speaking, they could still be statistically significant if they overlap slightly because these are predictions, so they actually take all the parameters into account. Technical stuff. But nice dot plots like this. Yeah. So, some notes on it. There's a lot in this package. It can do a lot of cool things. And as far as I've seen, it is the absolute best way to do these sorts of plots. It blows away what the alternatives were um, you know, before it came out. 
Um, it can't do quite everything, but it works with an amazing number of models. It works with uh, hierarchical models to do crazy things. It works with all the different Bayesian packages. It works with everything out there to produce these things, and it just works. You just pipe stuff into it, and it's like, you do your thing, and it works. One of the only limitations it really has is that you can only go over uh, counter, like counterfactual values of three variables at once if you want to stratify over multiple things. So I'm going to show an example of a plot like that in a minute. Um, it can't do it, so you have to do that kind of stuff manually, which is a pain. Um, yeah, works pretty well. Okay. <coughs> Here's a bonus plot. This bonus plot is... Um, so the idea here is that I use ggplot2 for all my publication-ready plots. So in every article that I do, if there's plots in it, there's basically always plots in it. Tables suck. I don't like putting tables in papers. In an ideal world, I'll put a plot and put a table and hope the editor says there's no room for both and get me to put the table in an appendix. The plots are almost always better and more readable. This is the complete syntax pulled straight from the uh, um, R Markdown document that generates this article down here. So this, this came out in December. Um, my formal social control and changing neighborhoods paper in city and community. Um, this is one of the main plots in it. This is a plot of the estimated probability of uh, arrest given a lot of variables. This is the estimated probability of arrest given the race of the target of the police call. That is where the police called in a white person or a black person. Why is the predicted uh, estimate or the estimated probability? The group is the reporter. That is, did the person who called the police originally, were they white or were they black? Because they foolishly gave me those data. Um, and it facet, it's faceted on two categorical variables, the type of crime. Nuisance crimes are serious crimes. We got rid of sort of um, crimes that are kind of hard to define and things that are non-criminal. Nuisance crimes being things that are essentially vagrancy type charges, like minor stuff. The stuff you'd expect that they're picking up black people for, not white people, which is true. Um, and then it's stratified by the type of neighborhood, where we used a latent class mixture model to classify neighborhoods into categories of stable white, disadvantaged, or changing, which are essentially gentrified neighborhoods. If you're familiar with Seattle, you know exactly what they are. Um, yeah, and then I've done a complex plot where I have points and I have um, confidence intervals around them. <clears throat> All the other stuff is stuff you've seen, manual fill, or manual like scale here for the fill. I just wanted to make sure that the dots for white people are white, the dots people for, for black people are black, so it's readable. Um, and then, you know, a theme, and I modify some things minorly. The plot looks like this. It looks like a basic ggplot. You'd see it from a mile away, and that's a ggplot, and he was lazy about correcting it, but I was like, ah, whatever, we'll leave it base looking. So this is probability of arrest by reporter and target race and neighborhood and crime type. Four categorical variables on a single one, and the crazy thing is, if you know what you're looking for, you can find the exact probability really fast. So, for instance, let's say I want to know, what is the probability of a black person being arrested when a white person calls the police on them in a stable white neighborhood for a nuisance crime? It's the top right white dot up there. The answer is, for that nuisance crime in a stable white neighborhood with a white person calling the police on a black person, they are eh, 0.875 probability of being arrested in that white neighborhood, which you can compare to sort of like other neighborhoods that are sometimes substantially lower. And you know, you also see here that the response, the um, uh, Responsive, that's what I should look for. The um, responsiveness of the police to black people's calls for those same ones are drastically lower. So if everything else is the same, but a black person called the police, there's a drastically lower probability. I mean, it drops from what, 0.875 to just under 0.8 there, probability of arrest, given everything else about that crime is exactly the same. So this is one of those things that's like, there's a lot of information being conveyed here. It's not necessarily the easiest plot to understand, but it shows you how with Really, when it comes down to it, not that much syntax. You can have a plot that conveys a tremendous amount of information into a paper in a publication-ready format. Yeah. And didn't they really ask what color you are when you're calling? Like, I called police, not they never asked me. Yeah. So, the interesting thing is, yes, in Seattle, very often. So what happens is, if they've arrested the person or done some type of police contact, they do a post-interview and they collect the information on the, on the people. So the answer is yes, they do, in fact. Uh, race data on callers is rarely missing in the police data that I have. It's pretty interesting. Um, the thing is, is usually uh, they just won't tell you they have those data or they collect them in the first place. Um, it's kind of fascinating. But they just gave us the entire police database. They were just like, yeah, take everything. Um, and that was one of the things in there. Also, all kinds of wild stuff. I mean, that, that database has stuff that you never think that they would give anyone. Um, 
like ev I have a record of like the full lifetime like tracing of flows of every piece of property ever involved in any crime in Seattle between 2018 and or 2008 and 2012. They're extending it now to 2018 for me soon. Um, yeah, the Seattle PD, uh, their data department is all about research now and all about supporting the research, even things that don't look good for the police department. So the rest of the police department, not often a big fan of this kind of thing, but the guy at the data department loves this paper. He helped me on it like a whole bunch, giving us all the information. I was like, okay, this not used to be SPD like five or six years ago even. Um, yeah, so kind of neat. Anyway, big plug. Kieran Healy's Data Visualization of Practical Introduction is a data viz book that assumes basically no R knowledge, teaches you tidyverse ggplot style working with R, with good visualization principles, targeted people with sort of social science, non-technical backgrounds. It's free online in a online version. The print version is really nice. I have a copy like on my desk. I think this is the best intro viz book out there. It's terrific, if you want to work in R anyway. There's good Python books too. But this book is just terrific. And Kieran Healy is, is sort of a, a neat guy, he's a sociologist, he's really cool. Um, follow him on Twitter, he's very funny. Um, yeah, so anyway, that is my presentation for today. Any questions? Yeah. And it doesn't have to be questions specifically about this kind of content, really anything, I'll field anything, I got plenty of time. People pretty good. <laughs> I'm, just at, I'm just at work and I have to go back to work. So. Oh, that's tough. That was awesome. Thank you. Um, I just said that I missed, you apparently did a number of these. They're all videotaped. So oh, I saw, you know, actually, I think I saw those links. Yeah, um, they're videotaped, so there's Panopto, so with a um, UW ID, you can get to the Panopto one, and um, also if you go to the website I linked on here, I have them also converted to YouTube, because I have a YouTube channel. In fact, my entire CSSS 508 class is, a, is YouTube videoed. Um, so that's from the very beginning, yeah. first, the first uh, slide. Yeah, so if I just go uh, right here, um, to the, the first web page right here, yeah. um, the initial web page, if you just click UWC triple S 508, this is everything in my, my full term long class that I teach, including like for instance, uh, I could go down here and I could click like lecture video three will pop up uh, on my YouTube channel and I have Panopto, like re recordings of my full Panopto ones here. So I could, you know, if you want to know anything about it, I do YouTube everything. And I link them off of my main one too because uh, I found that the workshops I've been teaching here at UW Tacoma are super useful for the students in other classes. So I just send them like the introduction to our workshop that I did here, the first one I did here, you know, I've got right here is a YouTube link and it goes to its own web page here. So I just put those front, front on my class page um, and I just send them out to people. And uh, if you think this stuff is useful to anyone you know, yeah, so here's last time I did it. Yeah, if you find this is useful to anyone you think, share my stuff with people. I also will answer like email questions and stuff. I just am super excited about this stuff. 24 hours a day, like I'm asleep and I'm still excited about it. So um, yeah, I, I'm super into it. Do you have their information about the class you mentioned, the simulation? Mm. I'm in the middle of working on it. So if I go to my GitHub right here, uh -huh. um, Everything I do is publicly available. It doesn't matter what it is. All my projects, almost all my papers, if they're not super confidential, like data, are listed up, uh, are on here, um, usually with the data available, all the code. Anyway, so Soch 321 is my new, um, I don't have much on it because uh, this particular class, the simulation one, I haven't taught yet. I just got asked to do it. Um, so its actual page is. So are you taking just people who just have basic math background and showing them how to do Monte Carlo simulations? Yes, no no stats or math background oh. at all. I, I expect that they know um, what y equals mx plus b means, <laughs> but I will still show them uh, what that is. So um, no, nothing at all. So this is the, the class that I'm working on here, but mainly I've got a, a syllabus up for it. So this is it's data science and statistics for the social sciences one, but it's based on these two ideas that um, basically every, Every common statistical method you teach in an intro class is actually just a type of linear model. So if you teach people a linear model, they'll know how to do everything. T-tests are a linear model, ANOVAs are a linear model, chi-squareds are a linear model. If you teach people how to use LM and transform variables on both sides, you teach them everything. And then you don't have to teach them anything about, um, the only assumptions you have to teach them are uh, 
omitted variables and independence of errors. You don't have to teach the rest of it, like spherical errors and stuff, because your linear model is inherently corrected for all that stuff if you use simulation and randomization. So the other one here is Alan Downey's there's only one test. So this is Alan Downey's approach to it, that all hypothesis testing is actually just the same test, where you start with, you have data and some model of the null hypothesis. You simulate your null hypothesis and look at the distribution of your real data under that like null. If it's sufficiently different from, if your, your tested value is sufficiently different from the simulation, it's statistically significant and you can construct bounds on that. The neat thing about that is that doesn't rely on any approximation of like a normal distribution or anything because you simulate your distribution out. So that means you get rid of all of that stuff where you have students manually calculating distance from the mean on a normal distribution and stuff. You don't do it. And it's silly to be doing it because computers will do it with far more precision than we can do. Right? And so you just teach them how to do it on the computer and that, by that you're teaching them some programming. So I teach mainly to sociologists, and a common complaint that sociology students receive from like their parents who don't understand are like, well, you're not learning any useful marketable skills. So I'm teaching a class that's 50 percent, well, it's 30 percent um, data manipulation and programming, 30 percent basic stats, 30 percent visualization. Everything in the class has to be turned in as um, uh, documents that have um, embedded code inside them that render as like PDF documents and stuff. So they're actually learning how to do um, reproducible research practices, make memos and stuff they could do in a job or something like that with embedded stats, simulation, all that. So they're actually getting like in one term everything they could need to go somewhere and do like analytics better than like undergrads coming out of, I mean, better than our econ undergrads and stuff like that by far um, in, in like a one term class. Because as it turns out, it's really easy to get through all that in one term if you don't spend all your time making people manually like derive a correlation, you know, or a chi squared. And it's just, it's like wild that we still do it. Uh, and the thing I said about everything is a linear model, this is a really cool thing. Um, there's this little sheet that this guy, I, found, I just found it on Twitter, uh, it's amazing. This shows how all these different common statistical tests are in fact just a type of linear model. So, you know, one sample t-test, Wilcoxon tests, paired sample t-test, Pearson and Spearman correlations, you know, Man Whitney U, two samples, ANOVAs, Kruskal Wallace, chi-squared test, all those things. You could fit them all with a standard linear model function in R and just with setting up the formula. So that means you don't have to teach people, oh, do a t-test on this, do a linear model, do on this, do on that. It's actually all the same test. They're all equivalent. They're all linear models. And so you're just like, oh, I only have to teach people one thing. And this is actually how like a lot of like um, econ PhD programs start people off teaching everything as a linear model. But then they, they kind of blow up and they go in all sorts of directions. So if you teach everybody this way, I just think it's the way to go. It's, um, I just saw this and I was like, I'd known this myself because I think about these things this way, but it's sort of like this magical secret that then nobody teaches you unless you spend, you know, take 45 stats classes like I did. But, you know, it's like this is like, oh, okay, I can teach people one thing and then they know how to do it. And the neat thing is then you can generalize it to some other stuff. It's like, okay, it's not a big jump to then go to things you can't fit with a standard linear model. You know, okay, maybe I do want to jump to something like a, a logit model or something like that. It's an easy jump because it's, the formula is going to be set up the same. You're just saying, oh, well, I'm, I'm transferring, I, I'm transforming the actual linear component of it, right? It's just you change the link, and you're like, oh, okay. And I found if I explain this to like um, people who don't know anything about um, stats, it, it just makes sense. It's it's, there's, it's jargon free. You're like, we're going to draw lines, and we can plot every single one of them, and we're going to show how like you know. Like a, you know, a t-test, or not t-test, but like an in, this is an independence of like a single mean test. Is it different from zero? It's really just drawing a horizontal line in a big scatter plot and seeing how far away from zero that is, right? And we can just randomize the data and see if that would happen by chance or not. That's two lines of code. Find the mean, simulate. And then how often does that happen? Oh, okay, that's easy. And it's easy to explain randomization and simulation. If you talk about a null hypothesis, like what well, just says, at random chance, will this happen or not? So let's literally just run it 100,000 times and see how often it happens. So it's, it's actually a clearer application of null hypotheses than doing it the other way. Because it's just like, oh, if we randomly do it, this is going to happen how often? Let's, let's just do it that many times and see how often it happens. Yeah, so it's my, this is my jam. I'm, I'm wor I've, I've actually managed to sell the um, Center for Statistics and the Social Sciences at UW on the idea, but I know there's other people I'm going to have to sell on it, but I'm usually pretty convincing. There are many people who already sold on it. About 10 years ago, the mm -hmm. colleges, they started doing that, and it's all started from Carnegie Foundation. Yeah. And they have a free stats textbooks for like 110, stats 110. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, many instructors, like in the area, Highland Community College, I know. Oh, 
that's great. Pierce College, uh, Pierce is Peter Kaslik at Highline, Helen Byrne, and they kept giving this presentation at the math conferences, saying like, let's do it this way, right? <laughs> Uh, well, some people listen and they still open the book because every everything comes with a textbook, right? They pay two hundred dollars for textbook, yeah. and that's what students follow. However, there are free textbooks, like you just said, and you can teach this way with free textbook, mm -hmm. no money, students required to pay <coughs> zero, right? Uh, and I was wondering, like, uh, why don't we do it here? So thanks God you said it. Yeah, I use the book that I'm, uh, one of the books I'm considering using is Intro Stats with Randomization and Simulation. Um, uh, I've, I've used their one that's not randomization and simulation. This is open intro. The books are completely free. A PDF is $8, I'm not a PDF, but a, a hard copy is like $8 if you want one. But they'll send instructors like two copies of the books. They're fantastic. I've taught, I've taught an undergrad non-SIM class based within it. It's a great textbook. Um, it's open source. The, the code used to generate the textbook is available all the data. It's all done in R, which is kind of nice. So this one, I'm also considering another one, which is uh, um, which I'm working on right now. It's called um, Statistical Thinking for the 21st Century by uh, Paul Drack, which is a um, kind of a similar idea where it, it kind of goes into, um, it's got a little bit more on, uh, uh, what is it? Anyway, this is really good. It does like visualization stuff, talks about sampling, randomization, resampling, and simulation. Um, all that kind of stuff. This one looks really good, but I only just saw it. Uh, so this is one that um, this guy teaches for uh, Psych 10 or Stat 60 at Stanford, um, which I've heard really good things about, but I've only just started reading it, so I don't know if I'm going to use it. Luckily, I don't teach this class till the winter, so I will have read these textbooks by then. Um, but this is, this is an approach that I think, um, honestly, makes more sense for everybody than doing it the conventional way, but particularly for undergrads who are just blast, blasting through this in a term. And if you, if you teach it so that they have an intuitive grasp of all of this stuff, they can get into the weeds later. But if you, you open it and just be like, there's one philosophy here, there's not 50 different models that are all totally different. We just don't connect these things well. Um, that's my, my belief. And this is also a, a way for me to get undergrads to, to do all of the things that I always wanted to do as an undergrad. So like proper simple projects, lightning talks instead of 10 minute presentations, like do a three minute talk, stuff they might want to do in the, like, the real world. Yeah, you have to do these things and nobody ever teaches you how to do it. And so it's like, okay, you guys get to jump through these hoops and have a good time. Can um, I ask you another really weird question? Sure. Well, was that data real that you were showing earlier about the, the uh, life expectancy? expectancy? Gapminder? Yeah, that's absolutely. Those are real data. Was, um, what happened, what's happening in Africa? Mm. Is Africa going, AIDS. leveling or going down? It's the AIDS epidemic in sub-Saharan Africa. Yeah, it's unfortunate, but that's it's... It? Yeah, it's completely suppressed life expectancy and all of sub-Saharan Africa, massively, actually. And so by pooling um, uh, uh, Northern Africa with sub-Saharan Africa, it suppresses the whole thing, but in reality, they, could, they should be bifurcated in the data, because North Africa has a much higher life expectancy. Sub-Saharan Africa just plummeted in the 90s. It's starting to recover now, but it's still, it's just, you know, massive uh, life expectancy drain. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, there's lots of political engineering, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Thank you, Chuck. Absolutely.